Bonjour à toutes, bonjour à tous. Merci euh, d'être là. C'est pour nous un plaisir euh, et un honneur de recevoir euh, David Nirenberg, euh, qui est euh, en France pour une petite tournée organisée no notamment par euh, le LEM, le Laboratoire d'études des monothéismes euh, de euh, euh, Daniel Barbu, ici présent, que je remercie, qui à l'Université de, de Genève euh, a euh, organisé également la traduction du livre euh, dont on va parler, du grand livre de David euh, Nirenberg, euh, Anti-judaïsme, un pilier de la pensée euh, occidentale. Je ne présente pas... Euh, David Nirenberg, il a été longtemps euh, euh, professeur euh, d'histoire médiévale à l'université de Chicago. Il dirige actuellement, et c'est un honneur pour nous les médiévistes, euh, l'Institut d'études avancées euh, de Princeton. Euh, le public français euh, l'a connu, en tout cas dans, euh, du point de vue euh, donc des traductions, par euh, un livre, « Violence et minorité au Moyen-Âge euh, », paru euh, dans dans la collection Le Nœud Gordien de Claude Govard, ici présent, qui nous fait l'amitié de sa, de sa présence en 2000, je crois. Et c'était le moment, effectivement, où David, vous travaillez, et vous travaillez toujours, évidemment, sur ces questions de minorité, de pouvoir et de persécution. Et d'ailleurs, vous aviez mis au jour cette, cette structure de pouvoir qui faisait de la lutte euh, anti-sémite euh, également une rébellion contre le roi et de cela effectivement vous n'avez euh, cessé de démêler euh, les euh, nœuds euh, notamment dans ce livre que l'on va euh, maintenant vous entendre présenter anti-judaïsme qui, dont l'ampleur effectivement n'est pas simplement euh, visible par le nombre de pages mais par euh, je dirais la l'encours chronologique. C'est un livre qui parcourt l'ensemble de la pensée occidentale, avant même le christianisme qui commence à Alexandrie. On peut se demander d'ailleurs ce qui a fondé cet anti-judaïsme dont l'antisémitisme n'est qu'une des modalités et dont vous montrez au fond, le titre n'est pas usurpé, en tout cas son sous-titre que c'est un pilier de la pensée, bien au-delà effectivement de ce qu'on pourrait penser, une pathologie euh, des communautés euh, politiques, vous en montrez euh, l'intraitable et euh, l'effroyable continuité comme effectivement figure du pensable, c'est-à-dire que ce n'est pas simplement euh, une, un essai sur euh, les sociétés, ni le pouvoir, ni la haine, mais véritablement sur la pensée dont vous euh, euh, dévoilez au fond euh, un, 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 un terrible impensé, justement. Et euh, cette euh, discussion, vous allez la, la, la poursuivre, euh, Daniel, demain. Et euh, j'en je, profite pour dire que David Nirenberg sera euh, demain soir au musée d'art et d'histoire du judaïsme à 19h, je crois, pour présenter également euh, ce livre. Euh, merci. Merci de votre euh, visite. Et, et vous allez donc euh, vous exprimer donc, euh, en anglais. Mais ensuite, euh, eh bien, nous aurons une discussion pour celles et ceux qui veulent bien la mener avec nous dans la langue que vous souhaitez. David, c'est à vous. Merci. Merci pour cette généreuse présentation, professeur Boucheron, et, et pour l'invitation, mesdames et messieurs. C'est pour moi un honneur et un grand plaisir de me présenter devant vous dans cette institution historique. Et je suis profondément reconnaissant au professeur Boucheron et au professeur Daniel Barbou pour leur invitation, ainsi qu'au professeur Barbou et Philippe Borjo pour avoir accepté de traduire en français mon livre, et cet livre, <rire> dans la publication la semaine dernière, traduit par John Jackson, <rire> Cole Hackabot, euh, et l'occasion de cette euh, conférence. Je vous prie de m'excuser pour la langue que j'utilise aujourd'hui. Et compte tenu de mon accent, j'ai jugé plus prudent de m'exprimer en anglais, même si je suis désolé d'imposer une langue étrangère, surtout dans cet amphithéâtre qui occupe une place si éminente dans la culture française et mondiale. Donc, 
avec votre indulgence, uh, un peu d'anglais. So I've given my talk the rather pretentious title, Anti-Judaism, uh, Critical Thought, and the Possibility of History. So perhaps I should start by explaining why I think these three things should be thought about together. So what do I mean by the possibility of history? I mean some very general questions. Does the past affect how we perceive the present? Do our concerns in the present affect the ways in which we see the past? Does what we have thought in the past, the history of our ideas, affect what and how we think in the present and future? So really, in other words, how are the forms of life and thought at one point in time and place tied, or how do they affect the possibilities of life and thought in another time and place? This type of question once animated the discipline of history. But in the second half of the 20th century, many historians, philosophers, psychologists became increasingly suspicious of such questions. And rightly so, given the place of historical genealogies and teleologies in the formation of the nationalist, racist, colonialist ideologies that had brought tragedy to much of the world in the first half of the 20th century which is why uh, Michel Foucault, as he famously put it, and I do think the Collège has an important place in the turn of ideas I've just presented, as he put it in the 1960s, history is for cutting. He didn't say it in English. Now, cutting is indeed an important and critical, and I mean critical in the sense of seeking to question our certainties. Cutting is a critical possibility of history, and today, intellectual historians largely focus their efforts on reconstructing the context within which a given idea was expressed, rather than in exploring the, mo the movement and transformation of ideas across time and space. This emphasis, today's emphasis, on ever more particular historical contexts is valuable because it can help us to sever some of the fantastic continuities that cultures construct between past and present. So for example, the nationalist idea that France today is the same as the France of Charlemagne, those continuities that we know from the 19th century. But it does have, cutting has an important limitation. It cannot help us perceive those continuities or reconstruct or understand them. In the words of Montaigne, cut anything into tiny pieces and it all becomes a mass of confusion. He didn't say it in English either. I think that exploring the movement and transformation of ideas across time and space is an equally important and equally critical, and by critical again, I mean in the sense of seeking to question our certainties, an equally important and equally critical possibility of history. Neglecting it is dangerous because if the present is not independent of the past, if the cognitive possibilities of our own moment are in any way shaped by those of different moments in the past, then we need to, be, we need to gain the power to question our own habits of thought. That's a phrase I like to use, habits of thought. Our own prejudgments, our own prejudices. Um, lest we find ourselves acting in the grip of those ideas. So the problem really couldn't be more general. It affects all historical questions, but the history of thinking about Judaism poses a particularly acute example because it is simultaneously a highly charged field in the present. There's plenty of thinking about Judaism going on today, and one with what seems to be a very, very long history. Ancient Egyptians, spent a good deal of papyrus on the Hebrews. Early and not so early Christians filled pages attempting to distinguish between the new Israel and the old Israel. Muhammad's followers were intensely worried about the prophet's relations to Jews and to the Bnei Israel, the sons of Israel. Medieval Europeans invoked Jews, even when they lived where there were no Jews, uh, they invoked Jews to explain topics as diverse as famine, plague, and tax policies of their princes, and many, many more. And in the vast archives of material that survive from early modern and modern Europe and its colonies, it's easy to demonstrate that words like Jew, Hebrew, Semite, 
Israelite and Israel appear with a frequency that is stunningly disproportionate to the actual number of Jews living in those societies. So we know that Jew is not the same as Hebrew. Israelites are not Israelis. Well, in French, Israelite, Israeli, it's a little harder. Uh, Israeli need not mean Zionist or Jew or vice versa. And that many have been called Jew or Judaizer who in no way identify with Judaism. Yet we also know that these words and categories exist in close proximity, and that however much we may insist on separating them, on cutting, they have often bled together across the long history of thought. So given the political importance of some of these categories in our own time today, we should want to ask why so many uh, uh, why so many uh, diverse cultures, even cultures with no Jews living amongst them, uh, which many cultures today have no Jews living amongst them, uh, have thought so much about Judaism? What work did this thinking do for them in their efforts to make sense of the world? Did that work in turn affect the ways in which future societies, including our own, could or would think with or about Judaism? Without asking such questions, we can't be confident that our own understanding of our own world is not itself being shaped by old habits of thought, including those habits of thought I call anti-Judaism. So let me illustrate the problem, so far I've been speaking very abstractly, with the example of a thinker who lived and wrote at a time when such questions could not have been more critical. And I'm thinking here of Hannah Arendt, who fled Germany. I won't the text ignore for a minute. Just look at the picture. <laughs> fled uh, Nazi Germany first to Paris in 1933, and then to the United States. In part one of her Origins of Totalitarianism, published in 1951, she addressed a question very much like mine. How and why do ideas about Jews and Judaism become convincing explanations for the state of the world in a given time and place? And in that book, she stressed the failure of anti-Semitism as a sufficient explanation. The term anti-Semite labels enemies of the Jews and Judaism, but it doesn't explain the nature or the reason for that enmity. On the contrary, it implies, according to Hannah Arendt, that there is no reason for the enmity, that the enmity is irrational. But as she put it, and I give you the quotes here, an ideology which has to persuade and mobilize people cannot choose its victims arbitrarily. She made that point with a famous joke about the Jews and the bicycle riders. So the Jews, yes, well, what, why not the bicycle riders? Um, the choice has to make cultural sense if it's to prove convincing, capable of moving masses. And anti-Semitism in the early 20th century moved masses. Why and how do ideologies make cultural sense? One answer might be that ideologies make cultural sense because they accurately describe something about the world as it really is. This was, and that's the real, I keep on talking about the real, this is Hannah Arendt's approach, the real. This was Hannah Arendt's approach. Anti-Semitic ideologies describe something that the Jews really were, something that they really did. She found her strong link between ideology and reality in what she considered to be, quote, specifically Jewish functions in the capitalist economies of the modern state. All economic statistics prove, she said, and this is a, a quote from her, uh, from Origins of Totalitarianism, that German Jews belonged not to the German people, but at most to its bourgeoisie, hence anti-Semitism in modern Germany. I would answer differently the question of why ideologies make cultural sense. My stress would be on how our very perception of reality is shaped by the conceptual frameworks and cognitive tools available, which are themselves shaped by history. For example, Arendt's statistical truths were sometimes drawn from the fighting scholarship, as it called itself, of Nazis like Walter Frank and his Reich Institute for the History of the New Germany. So in other words, the statistics she was using were already shaped by anti-Jewish ideology. But even if she had chosen less partisan economists, they would still inevitably have been theory-laden. 
our thought always depends on concepts and categories which themselves have a history. Even the very words we use are already the products of long histories and shape the possibilities of thought, which is why etymology is such an interesting art. As Nietzsche put it, jedes Wort ist ein Vorurteil. Every word is already a prejudice, a prejudgment. For that reason, any critical theory should inquire into its habits of thought, its history, the history of its ideas, even its very words. But in the case of anti-Judaism, this proves very hard to do. In fact, Arendt herself specifically rejected this approach. She called it eternal anti-Semitism, and she didn't mean it as a compliment. Appeals to history, as she understood them, were simply attempts to deny that the Jews were what she called co-responsible for the ideologies aimed against them in the present because of what they really did and what they really were. Arendt's distinctions between our reality and the history of our ideas is a common and influential one, but it seems to me to be too sharp and too dangerous. Two of Arendt's fellow exiles, the philosophers Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno, put the danger well. In the 1930s, they also criticized what they perceived to be their fellow Jews' over-eager participation in economic life and understood that participation as the cause of anti-Semitic ideologies. People are anti-Semitic because the Jews are too capitalist. But by the 1940s, the fantastic force of European ideas about Jews seemed to them beyond any reality. What gave those ideas their power, they suggested in 1944, was not the relation to reality, but quite the opposite, their exemption from reality checks, that is, from the critical testing to which we humans subject so many of our concepts. They wrote, what is pathological about anti-Semitism is not projective behavior as such, meaning not prejudgments, cliches, stereotypes, but the absence of reflection in it. So here's a question. Why is anti-Semitism so resistant to reflection? Why should it be so difficult, even for the greatest thinkers of the age, and Arendt was a great thinker of her age, as was her teacher Martin Heidegger, another person who found it very difficult to uh, be reflective about anti-Judaism. Why is it so difficult to be reflective about these anti-Jewish concepts and these explanatory frameworks? The answer I propose in my book is that this has to do with the extraordinary place of Judaism in the history of critical thought itself. And that's why I called this uh, talk, Anti-Judaism, Critical Thought and the Possibility of History. Because critical thought in the Western tradition has so often imagined itself as an overcoming of Judaism, it has the capacity to introduce Judaism in whatever it criticizes. And so now I have to prove that to you across several thousand years in about 20 minutes. Now Karl Marx, who greatly influenced all thinking about critical thought in the 19th and 20th century, himself provides an excellent example, for good or ill, of the phenomenon. In two essays he wrote in 1844, on the, on the Jewish question and then together with Friedrich Engels' The Holy Family or The Critical Critique, Marx argued that Judaism is as much an attitude as a religion. It's an attitude of spiritual slavery and alienation from the world. This alienation is Jewish, but it is also the God, and money is the God of Judaism, but it's not exclusive to the Jews. Money is the God of any man, no matter his confessed religion, who uses it and who thereby alienates the products of his life and labor. So long as money is God, which is to say, so long as there is private property, not even the conversion of all the Jews to Christianity could achieve the emancipation of society from Judaism. Not even the mass conversion of the Jews could achieve the overcoming of Judaism. For Christian society, or any society, will continue to produce, as Marx put it, Judaism out of its own entrails, out of its own intestines. So for Marx, the Jewish question is as much about the basic tools and concepts through which individuals in a society relate to the world and to one another, 
as it is about the presence of real Judaism and living Jews in that society. It's actually very interesting. Marx understands that anti-Judaism is not necessarily about real Jews. He understood that some of those basic tools, such as money and property, some of the basic tools in society were thought of in Christian culture as Jewish, and that those tools that therefore produced the Jewishness of those who used them, whether those users were Jewish or not. Judaism then was for Marx not only the religion of specific people with specific beliefs, but also a category, a set of ideas and attributes. And anti-Judaism is not simply an attitude towards the actions of real Jews and their religion. Here you see a distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism. Anti-Judaism is about the ideas. Anti-Semitism is about the people. Anti-Judaism is not simply an attitude toward the actions of real Jews and their religion but a way of critically engaging the world, in this case of criticizing the use of money and capitalism and the social and economic inequalities it creates. So Marx's notion that the concepts themselves, the concepts we use, can create the Judaism of the world to which they are applied is critical. Critical because it asks us to reflect on how our own habits of thought project figures of Judaism into the world and thereby create the reality they claim to discover. From this insight, Marx could have proceeded to a criticism of those habits of thought. He might, for example, have asked why it was that Christian European culture so often characterized capitalism as Jewish, and he could have written a history intended to make his contemporaries reflect even more on that association, but instead he did the opposite. He exploited those habits, reinforcing the old Jewishness of capital to put it to a new kind of work, that of planning a more perfect world, a world without private property or wage labor. So Marx demonstrates how inquiring into the roles played by ideas about Judaism in our own thinking about the world can stimulate a type of reflection we need to become conscious of some of our own habits of thought. But he also points to the real danger in asking these Jewish questions. The danger that, like Marx, we stop asking them as soon as we reach an answer that we like, an answer that harmonizes comfortably or usefully with our own view of the world, such as the view that money is Jewish. Such questioning gives us the illusion of engagement in critical thought, while in fact it only strengthens our preconceptions, our, our prejudices, our convictions. So how do we not stop asking the question too early? Well, that requires a long history. How long? <laughs> it's a very thick book. Um, by the time accounts of Israel and the Jews become visible in ancient Egypt, they had already been intervo interwoven with other histories and cosmologies, and they'd become flexible enough to help their tellers make sense of events ranging from Greek invasion to Roman tax policy. We can glimpse this work in the surviving sources. For example, why should ancient Egyptians who go to talk to Roman emperors to complain about Roman tax policy, emperors like Claudia, uh, Claudius, Trajan, and Commodus, so not Jews, why does it make sense for ancient Egyptians to call those emperors to their face Jews? and oppressors, Jewish oppressors of the Egyptians. It must have made powerful sense to them because they were willing to be martyred for it. But it shows you how early these kinds of ideas were already uh, tied together. Um, similarly, the earliest surviving texts produced by a follower of Jesus, the epistles of Paul, are already engaging multiple traditions, both Jewish and Gentile, each with its own deep history, in order to create a critical theory that is, a theory about how to interpret the world, about why the world looks one way, but it really is another way. When Paul sets out to demonstrate that the earthly Jerusalem is aligned with slavery, carnality, law, blind literalism, and the death of the soul, he is deploying critical strands of Jewish exegesis and Greek philosophy, well-worn already in his own day. But he's weaving them together into new cloth, using them to think through different demands that prophecy places upon Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus. And some of the formulations he developed to explain his critical theory, such as the letter kills but the spirit vivifies from 2 Corinthians, transformed history 
as much as they drew on it, giving the future new ways to think about texts, about transcendence, and about the material world. And as Jesus' religion spread, Paul's specific vocabulary, which was already saturated in history, gained new meanings and new power. For example, this is, it seems like a very innocent verse. Uh, it's, it's Paul criticizing Peter because Peter appears not to, uh, doesn't want to eat with Gentile converts to Christianity. And he says, since you, though you are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to Judaize? And this word Judaize came to be used over time in Christianity to characterize any Gentile, to characterize any Christian's inappropriate relation to the laws and customs of a tradition. So Paul here is not talking about Jews. He's talking about Gentile converts to Jesus. But he uses the word Judaize, and henceforth this word becomes a way of thinking about Christianity, so that every Christian has inside their, their conscience the fear that they might Judaize if they misinterpret, if they, if they love the world amiss, if they too much care for money, too much care for law, too much care for letters. And I have here a, a very three lines from a poem by a Protestant poet, George Herbert in a poem called Self-Condemnation, so it already tells you how much this is about the Christian's own self-critique. George Herbert, writing in a world that has not seen living Jews for centuries, still thinks that he that doth love and love amiss this world's delights before true Christian joy hath made a Jewish choice and is a Judas Jew. So, so for Christianity, the place of Judaism in critical thought means that one can make sense of any form of mistake in relation to the world in terms of Judaism, and that every Christian must imagine their task as a form of anti-Judaism. And of course, it's not only Paul. The Gospels, too, are full of statements with the potential to teach the future to give the falsehoods and confusions of this world a Jewish face. As here in the seven woes of the Pharisees, uh, where, uh, the, where hypocrisy is itself characterized by mapping it onto the figure of a Jew. Um, some colleagues and I are now working on a book on hypocrisy because each of these concepts deserves its history. So in my book, I try to show that no step in the formation of this critical tradition was inevitable, though in retrospect, it came to appear inevitable to many Christians, Muslims, and also Jews. It became useful and powerful even in times and places remote from contact with living Jews. So medieval rebellions against Jewish kings, who were of course not Jewish, they were Christian kings. The Reformation and counter-reformation attacks on the Judaizing of popes and Protestants. So for Luther, the pope was Jewish. For the pope, Luther was Jewish. Even Shakespeare's creation of the character of Shylock in order to represent the potential Jewishness of Christian merchants. Again, at a time when the, the, the kingdom, the economy of England is transforming itself rapidly, uh, Shakespeare writes The Merchant of Venice, but there had been no real Jews in England for 200 years, and yet Shylock becomes the figure that represents a mistaken relationship to law, a mistaken relationship to money for, for, for English speakers into the present. So I think these are all understandable, not as reflections of reality or products of irrational prejudice. So not as Hannah Arendt's choice and not as anti-Semitism is an irrational prejudice, but as aspects of these cultures' most fundamental habits of critical thought, constantly transformed by being put to new kinds of work. And the creative capacity of these habits of thought did not end with the Enlightenment. Spinoza, Bale, Voltaire, Kant, and many others took aims at the idols of thought they argued underpinned superstition, intolerance, and injustice by using some of these same anti-Jewish ideas. Dare to know, smash the infamous, they and their colleagues proclaimed, but far from smashing the idol of anti-Judaism, they gave it a new cult, representing their opponents as Jews. Those opponents were, of course, Christian kings, courts, and clerics. But the struggle was against the spirit of Judaism, as the Baron d'Olbach uh, named his uh, book from the 1770s. 
all of his contemporaries would have understood that the book's exhortation, then dare, O Europe, break the unbearable yoke of the prejudices by which you are afflicted, and again, he didn't write it in English, was to break free of such Jewish habits of thought, which for Dolbach was all of organized religion. The champions of the traditional Christian order also loaded their guns with the same charge, the same anti-Jewish charge, but they aimed it against their enlightenment critics. For the defenders of the old order, their opponents were materialists, literalists, Jews, and Pharisees who re refused to recognize any God other than human reason and the material world, and who treated social and political bonds as if they were commercial contracts. On both sides, the critical discourse of anti-Judaism became so important that by the 1790s, the greatest contemporary thinkers across all of Europe could debate whether the French Revolution represented, on the one hand, a victory of the Jew brokers in which the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. That's Edmund Burke writing against the French Revolution or whether the French Revolution represented the defeat of a, quote, Jewish order that turned constitutions into dead books of hard and flexible letters and reduced subjects to animals in the starkest contradiction of the spirit of mankind. That's Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who also wrote that they should decapitate the Jews, that the French Revolution had, had succeeded by decapitating the Jews, um, writing in defense of the French Revolution. Of course, the number of Jews in revolutionary France was vanishingly small. The role of Judaism in these debates was, however, deeply meaningful. It was the product of a long history, a history that put Judaism at the center of the most vital questions and distinctions of European culture. The distinctions between spirit and matter, soul and body, faith and intellect, freedom and necessity, the list is Hegel's, not mine. Western Europe and its heirs had learned to think of all of these distinctions in terms of their Jewishness. I quote Hegel because he himself, in giving this list, was no different. In fact, he saw his own philosophy as an overcoming of the Judaism of all earlier philosophies, especially Kant's, which had similarly, by the way, Kant had also understood himself as being in a struggle against Judaism. In his predecessors, Hegel saw, quote, the Jewish principle of opposing thought to reality, reason to sense an opposition he proposed to overcome through a dialectical synthesis modeled on Christ's incarnation. For some, that was a congenial solution. But for others, such as Schopenhauer, it was Hegel's philosophy that represented Jew mythology. And the Hegelians who stank, he, this is his words, not mine, who stank of Judaism. It's only by taking seriously the logic behind this Judaizing discourse that we can understand not only how philosophy, but also all of modern Western culture could meaningfully be criticized in terms of Judaism. From music to mathematics, uh, this is uh, for, for the mathematicians among you, every modern field of thought produced its critical discourse of anti-Judaism. As an Austrian politician quipped in 1907, culture, all of culture, is what one Jew plagiarizes from another. Kultur ist, was ein Jude von einander abschreibt. But we should not confuse the Judaism produced by this discourse with whatever we mean by real Jews or Judaism, or whether, whatever Hannah Arendt might have meant. Of the 112 artists condemned in terms of Judaism at the Nazi Degenerate Art Exhibition in 1937, only six were Jews, even by the Nazi definition of race. The same could be said of, the, of many of the musicians, such as Hindemith, or the mathematicians, such as Ernst Zermelo and David Hilbert, and countless others whose work was denounced by the Nazis as Jewish. In fact, the Nazis even started a German mathematics journal, Deutsche Mathematik, which was meant to exclude Jewish mathematics. So there was really no field uh, exempt. Of course, the Nazis were the most relentless and the most successful impresarios of this critical discourse. They presented themselves as rebels against a falsely critical thought that had enslaved the world to Judaism. That's Goebbels' famous quote at the burning of un-German books in 1933, the age of rampant Jewish intellectualism is at an end. 
But their success in deploying their ideology, that is, their success in mobilizing much of Europe to attempt to murderously purge itself of the Judaism that it thought afflicted it, cannot be explained by the real function of the Jews in Europe, or as Arendt thought, or by some eccentric fantasy imposed on a populace by a powerful propaganda machine. The success of the Nazis took place within a history that encoded the threat of Judaism into the th some of the most basic concepts of Western thought, regenerating that threat in new forms for new times and helping many of Europe's citizens, even its most educated and critical, make sense of their world. Without understanding that history, we cannot understand how a society could so terribly confuse the nature of the dangers that assailed it and motivate itself uh, to carry out the kinds of massacres it carried out. Okay, today we live in an age with its own Jewish questions. So I've gotten to the present. An age in which many millions of people are exposed daily to some variant of the argument that the challenges of the world they live in are best explained in terms of Israel. Like Arendt, many of today's self-styled critical thinkers reject the possibility that histories of thinking about Judaism can tell us anything vital about those pressing questions. Some see such histories as nothing more than special pleading, that is, as attempts to deny the responsibility of a people, in this case, say, of Isra Israelis, for the criticism levied against them. As, for example, when histories of anti-Semitism or the Holocaust are invoked to silence critics of the state of Israel. And they're often right. History can easily become unreflective. History can be used to impede criticism rather than to further it. And yet it seems to me that the greater danger lies in too easy a confidence that our realism is independent of the past. We make our own history, but we don't make it as we please. And an awareness of the gravity that the past exerts upon us can help us understand the ways in which we see the world. So my book ends in 1948 because I don't like controversy. But let me conclude here with some examples from the present, maybe because I do like controversy. Here's one. In both Western Europe and North America, one of the most powerful white nationalist and racist political discourses is called replacement theory. That is the idea that conspiratorial powers, conspiratorial powers often thought of as Jewish, are working to replace white Christian majorities in nations like France, think of Camus' 2011 de Grand Replacement, Remplacement, Germany, I'll give you Hungary, the United Kingdom, Canada, or the United States. Here is, um, in the United States, this, the movement is sometimes called the alt-right, the alternative right, and I offer you one kind of replacement theory quote. Such ideas animate political movements. They animate book reviews. This was a, a review in a, in a neo-Nazi newspaper of anti-Judaism. And they animate, uh, I don't mean to draw any comparison between these things, they animate also mass murders, such as the killing of 11 Jewish worshipers in Pittsburgh at the synagogue and of 51 Muslim worshipers in Christchurch, New Zealand the following year. And each of these killers left a manifesto, so you, you don't have to guess. You can read their manifestos to see uh, the kinds of ideas that motivate them. And then you can try to write their histories, and some of these are very long histories. Replacement theory is in some ways modern, even postmodern, and quite up to date. But it also draws on very ancient ideas. So Robert Bowers, the murderer in Pittsburgh, chose for his last social media post the words, right, right before he started shooting, the words Jesus addressed to the Jews who had believed in him. It's, this is actually true. Jesus addressed these words to the Jews who had believed in him, not to those who disbelieved. You belong to your father, the devil. This is the full quote. Um, and you want to carry out your father's desires. So let me focus on this last example, because here I gave you a social media post from a 2018 mass murder. Couldn't be more modern. And I want to make... Uh, an obvious point. It's not only the durability of these ideas that makes them dangerous, but also the way in which they are historically rooted in the religious reservoirs that contain many of humanity's highest 
aspirations, not our lowest ones, our highest ones. In this case, the New Testament. How deep are those historical roots? Well, let me stick with this example. Roughly 160 years after the birth of Jesus, an obscure author named Heracleon Philologus wrote a commentary on the Gospel of John. In fact, it's the first commentary we have on the Gospel of John, but we only have pieces of it. And he, he stopped at this point, passage, and he, he started to argue against Christians who already 160 years after the birth of Jesus were maintaining that this passage meant that the Jews were of the seed of Satan, that they were descended from Satan. And he said, Heraklion Philologos said, this cannot be. Satan is a purely negative force. The devil cannot create. He can only corrupt. The Jews might be adoptive children, but they couldn't be natural children of Satan. But this limitation on the demonic was dismissed as heresy by his near contemporary Tertullian, who argued explicitly against Gnostics like Heraklion and laid the foundation for much of what we today call Catholic theology and who preferred to stress the creative power of Satan's seed, passing that potential on to posterity. So in some ways, without Tertullian's victory over Heraklion, Robert Bauer's reading of Gospel of John is not uh, possible. So I offer you this because it's a nice example, or not a nice example, it's an example of how very old ideas about Jews already contained with certain early interpretations of scripture continue to affect attitudes towards Jews in the present. But we don't need to look so far back. And replacement theories can also be found in the sources of our most enlightened critical philosophies. Immanuel Kant, for example, sometimes seemed to think of the history of humanity as a long struggle between races, one in which victory will come only with the replacement of the non-white by the white. This is not the place to delve in detail into Kant's writings on race, and there were many. Um, but put crudely, we can say that he divided the races into two basic categories, white and black, and he sees these as locked in struggle. In his Menschen Kunde lectures, from the 1780s probably, and in unpublished notes from the same period, Kant seems confident that, quote, the race of whites contains within itself all motivations and talents, whereas blacks, they can be educated but can only be a servant, that's a quote. Hence, as he put it in a private note, all of the races will be stamped out. Alle Rassen werden ausgerottet werden, because they are too slavish or too stubborn incapable of abstract thought, but not that, never that of whites, again a quote. Unless, that is, the inferior races receive help. Help from whom? The answer won't surprise you. In the anthropology from a pragmatic point of view, Kant describes the non-white racial other as incapable of abstraction from body and materiality. He then turns to the Jews, who in keeping with Christian theology, he attributes similar traits, incapable of abstraction from materiality. But the Jews are much more dangerous because they are proximate to whiteness, both racially and socially. They are, he says, the Palestinians living among us. By Palestinians, he doesn't mean uh, what we mean today by Palestinians, he means the Jews. Enemies inside the gates, whose presence he seems to fear, may put at risk all the progress to which his enlightenment is dedicated. So my point is not that one can draw a straight line from the Gospel of John or from the writings of Kant to the manifestos of anti-Jewish, anti-Muslim, or anti-black thinkers today. My point is rather that these ideologies, ideals, and ideas of the present may be drawing on reservoirs of ideologies, ideals, and ideas from the past, even when we are unaware of them. In fact, the more numerous these interactions, the more difficult it is to be aware of them because they become part of our cognitive environment, our habits of thought. And I wrote the book to help myself become aware, and I hope others become aware of those habits of thought. So as a critical exercise, a use of history for critical thought. So let me pose as explicitly as possible a question that worries me. I'm going to skip. Um. Could the many people of goodwill in the world today, each of us trying to improve the world, not worsen it, be caught in a similar moment as Hannah Arendt? Are we living through a moment in which anti-Judaism is increasingly widespread, 
becoming acceptable as a language of critique across many parts of the political spectrum, yet we're un collectively unable or unwilling to detect and name the danger precisely because today it presents itself, as it so often has in the past, as a critique of realities of unjust power in the present. So are we living in an Arendtian moment? The most difficult example is, of course, and here is the kind of example I've always avoided in the past in speaking in public, but I will, since I'm speaking in French, I will try it. The question of Israel, which today occupies almost as much ground as what Marx and others called the Jewish question uh, in, the, in the 19th century, and which arises in almost every discussion of anti-Semitism, shaping every effort even to define the term. So at present, I, I skipped this slide, but there is a, a, a strong debate over this definition of anti-Semitism and whether it is uh, too driven by uh, support of Israel. I won't address the question or the controversy, and I won't address the question of Israel, except to say that once again, I feel as if we find ourselves as critical thinkers of goodwill, whether left, right, or center, and most critical thinkers are, think they are of goodwill. It's also true that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, but we all think we're of goodwill. Trying to distinguish between reality and anti-Jewish prejudice. The line now is drawn between, on the one hand, legitimate criticism of Jews, meaning criticism of Jews as real agents, sometimes with power, in an imperfect world, and on the other hand, an unacceptable anti-Semitism that distorts reality and casts Jews disproportionately as enemies of the good, primary obstacles in our improvement of that imperfect world. We should attempt to draw such lines, but in doing so, we shouldn't forget that the history of thinking about Judaism has itself shaped our own sense of the place of Judaism in the world, our own sense of reality, and, and our own convictions about what that line would look like and about where it should be placed. If we forget that, we become incapable of recognizing anti-Judaism at all, except perhaps in the discourse of the other side. So the left is very good at pointing to anti-Judaism in the right, the right is very good at pointing to it in the left, but never in our own. One way of putting the danger, in the first half of the 20th century, the reality of economic inequality and stark differentials of power between capital and labor made it impossible to perceive the grotesque power of anti-Semitism at work in European society. Are the realities of inequality and stark differentials of power in our own society having a similar effect, making it impossible to see the growing power that anti-Judaism may be acquiring in our own time and place. So I don't want to depress you. Let me leave you with my positive message. Um, one thing that history can offer us is an awareness that reality and anti-Jewish prejudice are not independent of each other, that it's easy to slip from the one to the other without noticing, even when we're focused on our highest ideals, precisely because those ideals have often been built through a long history of thinking about the dangers of Judaism. The slippage, well, that's not happy yet, but it's getting happy, hold on a sec. The slippage between reality and anti-Semitic ideas has proven very hard to detect, even for the subtlest lovers of knowledge, which is why I began with Hannah Arendt. Developing an awareness of the terrifying work that slippage has achieved at various points in the past is one of the best ways to cultivate a sensitivity to the danger today. That is the gift that the history of anti-Judaism can offer critical thought in the present and the future. I thank you for your attention and I, of course, welcome your questions. Bien, merci beaucoup, euh, David, pour euh, cette euh, impressionnante et vertigineuse euh, exploration de, de, ce que tu, de, 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 cette, euh, de la capacité qu'a l'histoire, effectivement, non seulement de, euh, de démêler euh, le passé du, du présent, mais de montrer au fond que des figures imaginaires, puisque l'antijudaïsme, on l'a compris, c'est la révélation d'un judaïsme qui peut se passer des juifs réels, puisque c'est d'une certaine manière la révélation, c'est ça qui est important, le dévoilement d'un monde judaïsé, c'est-à-dire amené à la chair, euh, 
alors que, mmh. euh, effectivement, euh, la lettre tue, c'est d'ailleurs euh, euh, le nom du nouveau livre de Carlo Ginzburg qui traite de, de cette question-là, euh, mais tout imaginaire qu'elle soit, cette euh, figure que tu déploies euh, dans la profondeur et l'amplitude d'une histoire de la pensée occidentale, eh bien, euh, elle débouche euh, sur la mise à mort des Juifs euh, réels. Et, et donc, euh, ça nous oblige, euh, effectivement, euh, à, à réfléchir en historienne et en historien euh, à cette euh, question que tu, encore une fois, tu, 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 tu montres si euh, ample et si euh, profonde, puisque on va, je l'ai dit, de Alexandrie à New York en passant par Amsterdam, Spinoza et les Lumières d'ailleurs et Paris. Euh, et puisqu'on parle de Paris et puisque nous y sommes, eh bien c'est à vous, à moins que Daniel, tu veuilles dire un mot. Oui, en fait, je, je me suis dit que j'ai vu quelqu'un lever la main. Voilà. Donc peut-être plutôt que de. J'aurais oui. évidemment des questions, mais euh, j'aurais pas envie de. 